So I want to take us, we, last week, Ryan left us on the doorstep of Acts chapter 13, and that's where we're going to pick up today. 13 and 14 become tremendous verses of encouragement because it's the first time that the church begins to send out missionaries. And this is going into places where there were synagogues, so they preached to the Jewish people, and generally speaking, the Jewish people would eventually reject Jesus, and they would then turn to the Gentiles, preach to them, and God began to establish churches, and it all starts right here in chapter 13. It's a pivotal transformational chapter it is like a hub that's what begins to happen in Antioch Antioch begins to be a whole new wineskin and I wish that we could fully grasp that so what I want to do is answer some common questions about these couple of verses and we're going to try to do it all within the next uh, 20 minutes. And then from, you know, those of you who are watching online, the, the live stream comes down at 12.15. And 12.15 then, if you need to be excused, you can be, but we, we reserve that as ministry time and as a overflow time. And what I do is uh, we, we don't broadcast what God is doing in your hearts, in your life, you know. So that's, that's the reason for that. We may have to rethink it at some point, but for now, this is the, the plan and the strategy. And I'm continuing to get people who, like, we're not making great records of numbers of people viewing us, but I continue to get people who have reached out to me, who have contacted me, who uh, either they were sick and they were home and they just valued what was going on, or that they wanted to find out more about Cornerstone and they wanted to watch a video. And, um, and, and then we've got friends around the world that, that love us and they want to be a part of it. So it continues. So today I just want to take a moment and to express to you at the beginning of this that this message has a, it's historical, it's a narrative. And some people would say, how in the world can you preach a doctrine from a narrative? Because a narrative is just a story about people's lives or what God did. And I would say that you can look at certain things that God has done in the past. In fact, three quarters of the Old Testament is, you know, a story. And there's the story of Israel and how God brought her about and how he covenanted with her. Then he promised her a Messiah, a king, to sit on the throne under the order of David. So when you look at these narratives, you look for patterns and you get to see the work of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes it's hard for us to get our minds around this so far removed. But I just want to say it at the beginning because if I don't say anything else today, I want you to catch this. So many times in the Pentecostal charismatic third wave movement spirit-filled expression we are satisfied with an experience now the experience is amazing which is why i think it's just beautiful that jeremy shared with us how that he wasn't even in the right frame of mind uh, things were not exactly as they should be and he and the lord began to communicate and the Holy Spirit just rushed in 
and filled him at, with the Spirit. And he knew that the Spirit of God had come in him because he started speaking in a language that he never learned before. And, you know, usually people say to me, Pastor, do you think I'm crazy? And I usually say, no, the biblical word is peculiar. You're not crazy, you're peculiar <clears throat> because we do believe in this, you know. And it's wonderful. And Jeremy, that's a doorway into the supernatural lifestyle. That's a beginning. That's a doorway. But it is really easy to be going after the, the experience. It's really e easy to be saying, I want an encounter. I mean, like, who wouldn't want an encounter with the Holy Spirit? Like, that's what we want. We want an encounter with the Holy Spirit. The only thing that is better is to recognize that this spirit that we have encounters with, he speaks, he listens, he can be grieved, he has emotion, he has a will, he has a desire. So he is a he, he's a person, he's a personality. So the only thing better than having an experience with him is actually fellowshipping with him, living with him, letting him live among us. So what we don't see after Acts chapter 2, after the Holy Spirit is disseminated into the two, uh, 120 and then the 3,000, and as it continues to move, we don't recognize that what you actually have is uh, occurring is that the person of the Holy Spirit is the one who is actually being written about but we talk about what happened to the apostles and the early leaders and the early christians we read the history but we fail to realize that in the midst of them was the holy spirit and he was moving them in a direction one of the things that he does is that while jerusalem was the center of the spiritual hub and rightly so from King David's day to the time of Christ, and everything happened there, and God permeated that city with the message of Jesus Christ, and many, many Jews accepted and embraced Jesus. Many also refused. But as the area gets saturated and the Holy Spirit moves into Judea, the surrounding area, of Jerusalem and then moves into Samaria. That's what's up with that. But you know, it's like outside of town and then on the other side of town and then begins to move in a northward direction. Then the center or the base of the Holy Spirit's hub of spiritual activity ends up being Antioch. Named after Antiochus Epiphanes. So from there, missionaries will go, they'll go into other parts of the world and they'll return. They go and they return. They come and they go. And so the new spiritual hub of this new actual wineskin that Jesus talked about, it's like you're going to have to get your mind around this, that what God had called Israel to do was not only to walk in covenant with him, but to also be a light to the nations. And um, oftentimes, too often, the nations influenced them and they fell into idolatry instead of worshiping the one true God. And then there were all kinds of things that went wrong. There was uh, deportation dysphoria into the nations of the world and so now in jesus day in the day of the early church you've got jews with synagogues planted all over the place throughout the middle east and into the near eastern areas and that's just different places where they had enough autonomy autonomy to be able to to establish a synagogue so one of those places would be antioch but in antioch there is no record in the scriptures that said that they went to the synagogue first. But they certainly did reach Jews because in Antioch you had Jews and Gentiles worshiping together. 
And as you probably can imagine, when you can't worship in the synagogue, the next thing is, where do you go? Of course, they went to their homes. They started there. But Antioch became so big, they didn't build a building. But I'm, I'm telling you, they had a worship center that was going on and would propel the gospel into the world. So Antioch becomes a, a significant place in the book of Acts. And I just want you to, to know that as we, as we start to read this testimony again. In Acts chapter 13, verse number 1, I'm going to read uh, five verses here. Um, now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Mannion, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. So Barnabas and Saul, if you read it closely, it looks like they're either prophets or teachers, or teaching prophets, probably. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said to them, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I've called them. Then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus, and they, when they arrived at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they also had John as their assistant. So I'm going to ask myself four questions. I think some of these questions are questions that um, many, many of us have. And uh, we're going to start with the question of uh, what are prophets, who are prophets, where are they today? And that, that question, before we go there, I just want to say that on Wednesday night, starting this Wednesday, for the next couple of weeks, what we're going to do is we're just going to study the model at Antioch. I'm just going to tell you, you are sitting in Cornerstone Fellowship, Assembly of God, and part of the reason we are here today, 30 years later, is because years ago, the Lord put a dream in my heart that we could see Antioch again. A New Testament expression that is multiracial, that is multi-ethnic, is male and female, Jew and Gentile, worshiping together with the input of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, because one of the weaknesses in the body of Christ is that most churches are pretty much run by pastors, which is a, an okay gift in office, but it's only one, and God gave us five to equip the body so the, the, the way to stop being a spectator church is when the body is equipped to do the ministry, which means that everybody gets to be a part of The Holy Spirit gets to function in and through everyone. And that dream was in my heart when we were asked to plant a church here. And I didn't know where to find an example. And so we just rolled up our sleeves and got to work. The way we got here, I would never advise anyone to take the path that we've taken. But nonetheless, here we are. And I still dream of Antioch. And if you have any kind of sense that the church can be more than it is today, please clear your schedule for the next couple Wednesday nights and let's pursue the pattern that we find in Antioch. Question number one, where are the prophets? Who are the prophets? What are the prophets? Who are they? What are they? Actually, um, Gary Shelton mentioned Graham Cook a while ago. We have had two national prophets um, minister here at Cornerstone. 
Graham Cook was one of them. That was in 2008, and uh, it was an amazing, wonderful, wonderful time. It was in that service that, or those meetings that uh, my son-in-law, Josh Garner, had his first introduction into the spirit-filled lifestyle, and he was filled with the spirit, and then later, you know, the Lord just did and is doing amazing things in his life. But it happened when Graham Cook was here and he saw God speaking through the prophet. It, it challenged him and, and it excited him. And, you know, it became a whole new life for him. So uh, the other person would be Alan Ross, the uh, Scotsman, who's incredible ministry and what I did to him is unthinkable you know when you ask someone to come minister to your church I said look if this gift works in the church it will work outside of the church and I asked him if he would be down for going to a ministry that we had going on in a strip club would you, will bring the girls out, would you prophesy to the girls outside of the strip club? And he's like, well, I've never done that before, but why not? My assigned job was to make hot dogs and hamburgers and make sure that none of the male members of our team snuck in the building. I'm only kidding. I did make hamburgers and hot dogs, though. And it was amazing to watch as lady after lady came out and we just introduced him as someone um, who ministers sometimes at the church and he just wanted to offer a prayer and most of them said yes. And he said a quick prayer and usually by the time he was done praying for them, they were already in tears and ready to hear something. And then he would just begin to speak over them words of truth and life. It was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Alan Ross has been here many different times, and he is one of my favorite people in the whole planet. And that Scottish accent just gets me every time. On that piece of paper on the back side, that the one that I had uh, scriptures on, there's um, a quotation there from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Paul, the apostle speaking, he said... He gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of Man, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning awareness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, and from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. It's just so beautiful, and it just kind of nails it, puts it out there. You know, John, I'm, I'm speaking John Cranacchio back there. Um, let's just go ahead and hit the 15-minute button and let people live streaming uh, continue with us, if you would, if he showed you how to do that. If not, we'll say goodbye in a minute. <laughs> so... 
in my opinion, like, I don't have the time, don't want to take the time to describe what an apostle is, what a prophet is, and what an evangelist is. But I'm just going to say this, that if we took a biblical look at it and not a clinical one, I think that you would see that uh, Paul the apostle would be one of them who would argue for this, that an apostle, a true apostle, is one who's seen the word of God, meaning Jesus. He's seen the word of God. And, and then... Uh, a prophet would be someone who's heard the word of God for a people, for another people. An evangelist is one who declares and proclaims the word of God. Um, I think pastors are those that teach us to love the word of God, to love Jesus. And I, I think teachers are the ones who, who help us to apply and to make, pull them away. They're, they're here. Um, the next thing is, what would it mean they were ministering to the Lord? Um, I like to say that when we, when we have what we call a harp and bowl meeting, is you, you lift your hands, you worship God until something needs said or something needs prayed. It's we're here to wait on him. I like to think of the servant. I like to think of the the server who comes to your table in a high-end restaurant and he's got a towel over his arm and he's come to wait upon you. We put the towel over our arm and we wait upon the Lord. Yes, Lord, we are here. Speak to us. What do you want to do? What do we need to know? What are we missing? What's going on? Uh, and you can actually see that, uh, again, looking at that uh, text that I gave you on the back page, uh, Numbers chapter 8, verse 13. Um, you shall stand, uh, uh, and you shall stand the Levites before Aaron and his sons, and, and then offer them like a wave offering to the Lord. So the Levites were the ones who became a part of the Levitical and priesthood movement. These are the children that either were not redeemed or these were the children who uh, grew up in the tribe of Levi. And in any case, their, their, point, their, their ministry was to wait on God, to be a, a part of functioning in the temple and the sacrificial worship system as it was then in that time. And I just wanted to say that, that one of the things that changes is that even though the Old Testament provides the, the structure and the, um, and, and the foundation for how the New Testament church would continue to worship or begin to worship, they, they actually had to go with something that, that they were not comfortable with. And now you have Gentiles who have no connection to Moses. They have no connection to the law. They have no connection to the history of Israel, the covenant. They have no connection there, but they've been grafted in by the, the work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. And so that all of that becomes a part of their inheritance, but they don't know it yet. They need to be taught that. They need to understand it. They need to be trained in it. But in the meantime, then it would be up to people like Barnabas and Saul or these other prophets who would say to them, look, now here's what you do. I know that you're used to worshiping your gods a many. And I know that that involved sexual things. It involved dietary things. It involved all kinds of offerings, all kinds of temple. But there's this one true God. And we're going to worship him. And here's what you do. You lift your hands and you glorify his name. And this God can speak to you. This God can communicate with you. An impression or through some other means. So I, I just want to take the moment and say that, that the church, in all of our tightness of schedule and all of our trying to accommodate people and make them feel comfortable, what we've done is we've, we've programmed out the time of the prayer meeting, the time of the waiting upon God. And the Holy Spirit is saying very clearly to me that it's time for the people of God to learn how to wait upon the Lord. 
and we are so ADD and so Ridland dependent that we don't know where to even get started. And I would say, do what I did. I got an hourglass. The Lord saved my life with an hourglass because it's an hour. And I turned it over and I said, okay, God, you can speak if you want to speak. You don't have to speak if you don't want to speak. You can manifest yourself to me if you want to manifest yourself to me, but you don't have to manifest yourself to me. See, here, I, I, I'm going to pretend that you're here, that when I gather in your name, you will be here. And so, like, I'm going to talk to you as though you were here, and if you're not here, that's fine, but I'm just going to have my say. And what I found out is that when I set an hourglass up, all hell broke loose. The phone rang. The, so many interruptions. But I was determined not to budge until that sand had all fallen down. And I mean, I'll tell you, I'll be honest, there was times I shook that thing and said, this sand has got to get down there quicker because it's not happening fast enough for me, you know? But in time... I learned that God wants to meet with me more than I want to meet with him. And I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, the honest truth, my hand on my heart, I could put my hand on my Bible, I've seen the hourglass stop. And I'm like, oh, God, now what? And you know, when God gives you a pause, you do something in the flesh. So I grabbed it and I shook it and nothing happened. And I set it back down and I said, God, surely you're in my midst. Whatever you want, whatever you need, I am yours. And there was another awkward pause. And I felt the Spirit of God say, tell him you love him. And I said, I, I love you, God. You've been good to me and kind to me. And then I felt the Holy Spirit saying, tell him you love him like you mean it. Your wife would not be happy with this. He did point out my wife. And I said, God, I love you. I need you. I don't want to do life or ministry without you. I don't want to live another day without you. I love you, God. And I just got as honest as I knew how to be. And I looked over, and after a short pause... The sand started falling again. And the Spirit of God quickened my heart and said, as surely as that sand is flowing, your life is but a moment on the earth. Choose how you're going to live it. Choose who you will live it for. Choose how you will spend your days. I, I was ruined. It was seven years ago. I don't need the hourglass anymore. But I'm going to tell you, I needed it in the beginning just to get focused. So ministering to the Lord takes a little bit of practice. But that's okay. God is patient. He's really patient. Now, how does the Holy Spirit speak? Well, most of the time through an impression, oftentimes through the Word of God. But um, I'm going to say that maybe in here, while they were waiting, as they were waiting on the Lord, as they're ministering to the Lord and they're fasting. And by the way, there's that fasting piece, right? You know, we know what it is. It's just how to do it, right? Um, 
as they were fasting and as they were waiting on the Lord, they had a sense that God was trying to do something, he was about to do something, and they wanted to get their ears tuned, spiritually speaking, to God's voice, and God spoke to them, and he said very clearly what to do. And I'm just going to go on a, on, on a ledge here and say, I'll bet it was either a straight-up prophecy, which would be in the native language, the other thing is it could have been a message in ter uh, tongues. Someone over here brings the message and someone over there interprets it, you know? And the miracle is that these two have not colluded with each other and you sit there and say, God is in our midst. And when that happens, you know, it takes everybody cooperating with the Holy Spirit. Let me just say about that is that I had been... Um, filled with the Spirit a few years before Judy and I were married. Now, a couple years after marriage, so like about five to seven years from being filled with the Spirit to about to, to the time I knelt down in, at my couch in my, in my house at the time, um, yeah, Irene gave us uh, these two love seats. They were kind of wooden framed and they had a leather uh, thing on it. I was knelt down at that love seat and I was talking to the Lord and I said to the Lord if you give me any spiritual gift you want I will use it for the glory of God to edify the church because I had been reading the Bible and I didn't see as much manifestation of God as I was looking for and as I prayed that prayer the following Sunday in my home church. There was a message in tongues, and the Holy Spirit says, interpret it. And I'm like, you interpret it, you know? <laughs> interpret that. You interpret It's like, well, there's always the ones that we could count on who would interpret it, but there was a pause, and the Holy Spirit's pushing me, and I've got my heels dug in, and I'm going, Ur -ur 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 you know, and, and he's like, interpret, and I'm just like, oh, all of a sudden, I just started with one word, and the rest of it came, you know, and then I'm like, hallelujah, you know, praise God, the next, I mean, that, that week, I was like, good to go, wow, saw God work wonderfully, but I sweat bricks, I didn't imagine myself doing that ever again so the next sunday comes around and he's like okay now this time i want you to bring the message in tongues and i'm like no <laughs> no i don't i don't want to do that again he pushes me i'm going eh, 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 oh, and he's pushing me and i'm like i i can't do that and he said can you pray in tongues i said absolutely then you can do it so I'm just, I just went for it. I just, at the appropriate time, I just started saying uh, what the Spirit was giving me. A long pause. No one interpreted it. And he said, now interpret it. And I'm like, oh, God, I'm on the edge. <laughs> and, and I all of a sudden, um, the, the interpretation came. I'm here today to tell you that that was the beginning. That was the beginning it was so, it was a shallow end. It was a very shallow end of moving in gifts of the Spirit. But I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, that what God did, has done, wants to do, he wants to do it in, in, in you, with you. And I'm here telling you how embarrassed I was. I can't imagine how embarrassed you might be. Would you please stand up with me? But I will tell you this. I believe that God wants to take us past our comfort zone and he wants to give us things that bring edification to the whole body. Things that bring um, a sense of the power and the presence of God in our midst. Things that we're, he wants to use us in ways, oh my gosh, then there was healings. And then there was other miracles. And then there was like, you know, prophecies. And then there was... Um, pinpoint directions to where a young girl who was going to freeze to death 
was located. I'm telling you that God is able to use broken, flawed human beings like me and like you to bring words of encouragement, to bring a ministry that causes the body to grow. And all of a sudden, you're walking up to someone and you're realizing that what God does in the church, this is the playground, this is where we learn how to do it, that what God is doing in the church, he wants to do in the marketplace as well.